Welcome to The Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast available at thehollywoodoutsider.com, as well as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. I'm Aaron Peterson. I'm going to be your host for this special episode because, as you might know, on occasion, when we want to share a film by filmmakers we love, we like to bring you interviews with those filmmakers and give you an insight into what goes into getting the projects made, as well as insight into that respective art itself. For this episode, I'm talking to Leah McKendrick. She's the writer, director, and star of Scrambled, which is now on digital to rent or purchase. I interviewed Leah several years ago for MFA, a movie I loved. I've talked about it for years. Still love it. Please go find it. And the link for that interview is in the show notes. It's an even longer interview if you want to hear that one. And it's one of my favorite films the last few years. But her new film, Scrambled, stars McKendrick as Nellie Robinson, a single woman in her 30s who begins to feel like the clock is ticking and she's running low on romantic prospects. So Nellie decides to freeze her eggs, setting her up on an empowering journey to a brave new world where she ultimately discovers the one she may be looking for might be herself. It's interesting because I've never seen a movie on this topic. It's completely new to me. And I found it fascinating. I found Scrambled to be funny, sweet, charming, heartwarming. And McKendrick put everything she had into the film, both in front of and behind the camera. Scramble is now available on demand, like I said, and I really hope everybody listening takes time after this or before this, whichever you prefer to watch it, because this is one of those movies I feel like fans will want to share with other fans. It's, it's one of those. It's a communal experience, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Regardless, Lee is always a joy to talk to and listen to, so I hope you enjoy my interview with Leah McKendrick on her new film, Scrambled, out now. Hi, how are you? Hi, Aaron. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. You look nice and plush. You're very comfortable. Cozy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I was telling somebody earlier, I did an interview earlier, and I was like, all the glam squad is gone. All of my the stylists are gone. Now it's just me and my couch. <laughs> <laughs> the last remaining interviews as the film is up on VOD. So you're just getting me. No, no glam team anymore. It's all good. How, how are you feeling? I'm feeling okay. I'm sort of in transition between, you know, fighting for my film and now building the next one. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm, I don't feel like I have that, those calluses built up right now to handle notes and (laughs) (laughs) the long hours. And I'm sort of, I don't know, I guess I wish I could be on vacation a bit, but I kind of can't right now. I I had a little vacation over the weekend. I went to Vegas and saw Christina Aguilera, but I think (gasps) that's kind of. Was she magnificent? Magnificent. Yeah. Still has it. She's such a star. Hasn't lost a step. All right. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember when we talked about MFA or MFA years ago. Do you remember this at all? Because you I do. do interviews, do you? Okay, well, that's good, because then I won't feel too stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm watching Scram, great movie, by the way. I actually Thanks. had a pass for it at South by last year, and, and uh, it's a whole transportation, you know how transportation is there, and the timing was off by like five minutes, so I missed it. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. It's very sad. Bummer. Which screening was it? The first one or was, the second one? The third one? Do you even remember? It was the no Monday. It was Monday. Yeah, I think that was the second one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, mm. but I still got to see it. I'm pretty happy that I saw it. Uh, I watched this one. This was interesting because I watched it with my wife, and and usually when I'm screening a film, this is how it usually goes. Right? She doesn't care. <laughs> she walks in <laughs> and out. She doesn't care. This is the first one I can remember in a long time where she sat down and watched the whole movie. And, and oh, yay. yeah, she yeah. loved it. She loved it. And then it was about halfway through and, and she actually stopped. Is she the one? Wasn't she in MFA? Wasn't she in? Yeah. So that's pretty wow. cool. Oh, yeah. she knows me. That's awesome. <laughs> she does. Love to hear it. So I, I want to start with Scrambled. I know you've, you've done a lot of interviews. I don't like recycling questions, but it's part of the, it's part of the movie. Yes. Uh, tell me why you made Scrambled. I know it's very personal to you. Do you mind sharing that story again? For sure. I, I froze my eggs in 2021. I was 34. They really do tell you whether intentionally or, you know, hinting, Strong, you know, a lot of strong hinting happens mm-hmm. in your 30s telling you that 35 is this huge cutoff 
it's like a drop off where your your eggs are basically dead and that messaging is really powerful whether you would like to subscribe to it or not which i pride myself on on not being someone that falls for a lot of this patriarchal bullshit messaging that's that is constantly i'm bombarded with as a woman but it hit me it hits you at 34 right and it, i was in a pandemic and I was isolated mm -hmm. and I thought I'm going to freeze my eggs and I'm not even going to think about it. You know, single girl, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to not think about it. But I I was prepared on some level for the injections. I think a lot of women are freaked out by having to, you know, shoot up, shoot yourself <laughs> up with hormones. And I was no different, but I was surprised by how emotional the process was and how existential it was. And how much I felt like a failure and how lonely I became in the process. And I was Googling films about a single girl freezing her eggs and it just didn't exist. And so I felt like I, I needed to make the movie that I wanted to see in the world. I honestly had no idea about the entire journey. I, it, this is all new to me. So, and honestly, I, obviously I'm not a woman, uh, but, you know, I have a daughter, I have a wife, you know, I care about these things. And I, and I have a friend that went through in vitro fertilization. So I know a little bit about that process and surrogacy and basic forms, but I didn't know the lengths of this process, what it entailed. And I'm imagining you didn't know either. What, why was it so important to you to do that? I guess just because your clock's taking that whole mentality that they keep yeah, prescribing. For sure. But also I didn't want to put pressure on relationships that weren't working. Mm -hmm. Does feel like I, you know, there's that famous quote. I don't want to attribute it to Sheryl Sandberg if it's not her, but I feel like it is. And the quote is the most important career decision you will ever make is who you marry. And I think about that a lot. And and to me, the way that I translate that is I the person that I marry needs to be someone who believes in my dreams, celebrates who I am, loves me despite my flaws, and maybe even hopefully because of some of them, sees that, you know, I'm a whole human with lots of different colors. And I think what happens for a lot of people in their 30s, especially women, you start trying to fit a square peg into a round hole because you know that you're running out of time and you start compromising and settling on some of these things. I'm no different. I had, I've been in relationships, several relationships that I, I really wanted to make work, whether it's because you love them and you, or because you just think if we could just get on the same page, if we could, if I could just change a little bit and he just changes a little bit and you realize that Passion and love is so important, but compatibility is so necessary. It's and that's hard to find, you know? We are a planet of seven plus billion people that all have, that we were all, come, we're all unique individuals. So um, that was part of it was I wanted to take off some of the pressure of my dating life. So I didn't feel like I had to make it work with the next, next guy because my time was running out. That was one thing. And also because my career is so important to me and is really, one of the great loves of my life. I love what I do. I fought to be able to make movies. Nobody's handing you this mm -hmm. stuff. Maybe if I was, I don't even think if you're the daughter of Spielberg, do you get handed a movie? I just don't think it works that way. You really do have to prove yourself. And I wasn't ready to have a baby. Even if I had the perfect man in front of me, I was not ready to go through that. I still today, it's been a couple years, I'm still not ready. And I... And I just was like, I need more time. I need to buy myself more time. And I need this edge of this ticking clock that is taking over my mind. I need to just silence it a little bit. Uh, I think one aspect of that, you know, kind of piggybacking off what you said, it was interesting to me as you, as you go through the film, you know, it's a, it's a whole journey. And obviously I would never spoil anything for anyone, but you do, <laughs> you do very much pay respect to women who don't want kids to to yeah. women who you know just want to be an aunt or just want to be yeah. a, whatever they want to whatever they whatever you choose to be and you don't even know like in the course of the movie you're trying to trying to figure it out which i'm sure you were i i really like that dynamic because i i do think well, i do know that a lot of 
girls grow up with families that motherhood is just kind of like thrown into your life, but you have to do this. Or this is, this is a very important thing. To you. And I, I like that you, you are going through this journey and going, I don't know. And I think it's okay if I don't know. Yeah. Is that something that was important to you while you were putting this together that it, it didn't, it wasn't just about, I have to have kids and I just don't. Oh my know. God. Big time, big time, big time, because I have a lot of friends, some, you know, it's interesting because some, I have very close friends that it was like they hit a certain age and they could physically feel their body hungry for motherhood. Like there, it was like they could feel their ovaries aching and they would talk about it to me and it would make me feel, I mean, sad for them because I want them to be able to live all of their dreams and have, have babies Mm -hmm. at the right time. But for me, I just didn't relate to it. I just was like, I don't have that feeling at all. Mm -hmm. If I ache for anything, it's for my work. It's to be able to do the things that I dream of doing. It's to make a musical. Like I I ache for things, but it's never a baby. And I started to think maybe I'm not meant to be a mother. Maybe that means I'm not maternal. Maybe that means I wouldn't be a good mother. What if I had a baby and, and it still didn't kick in? And that maternal instinct and the ovaries, they just weren't speaking to me. And so when you hit an age where the whole world is telling you, you might be, you might've missed the boat to be a mom, but at no point did you wake up wanting to be a mom? You start to wonder if it's even meant for you. So to this day, I still feel that way right now because I have met the man that is my partner that I believe I'm going to marry and maybe have kids with, but it does scare me that I go, well, I have this missing piece now that I didn't have when I was freezing my eggs and I still don't wake up with my ovaries aching. There's, there's <laughs> so nothing really wrong with that. that. Right. The yeah. world. And I, you know, that intellectually that there's nothing wrong with that, but I think emotionally you still think there must be something wrong with me because um, if I say that I want kids, but I, for why, why am I, is that just something that I've been programmed to believe if I'm not really feeling that way? And I, and my, one of my, it's funny that you say a, a, an aunt because my Tia I'm I'm Nicaraguan, so we say Tia, um, who was she raised me with, along with my mom, my mom's aunt. So my great aunt never had ki- never got married, never had kids. She was the first dentist, woman dentist trained out of Nicaragua, her country, our country. Wow. So it's kind of like this feminist icon, and she never got married and never had kids. And so on some level, I always remember thinking it was so, sort of weird that she never got married, but I didn't ever think of her not having kids as weird because I thought I thought of her, I thought of myself as her kid. You know, mm-hmm. I thought of me and my siblings as her kids in some ways. But now that she's passed away, she passed away in my 20s and she was a really big part of my my life, my upbringing. I think I wish I could talk to her and I wish I could ask her you know, when she made that decision and if that was difficult, if it was a decision or if it just, that's just how life turned out. If she ever wanted kids, I don't, I don't have the answers that I wish I had, but I think on some level I was raised to believe that you don't need to get married and have babies to be a legend the way (laughs) Tia is. (laughs) To be a legend. (laughs) Well, I also love the relationship with, with Nellie and her dad, um, as I have a very close relationship to my daughter, so I need all the reminding I can to take my head out of my own ass sometimes and <laughs> be mindful of what you say, how you say it, you know, and Clancy Sorry. Brown, wonderful actor, by the way. I'm glad you got and, him. He's always so good. Oh, such uh, an icon. Was that a reflection of your own relationships with your dad and also your brother, um, played by Andrew Santino? Yeah, the dad relationship is a tough one in the film. You could argue that there's not really a bad guy in the film. You could argue that it's kind of Nellie against herself or Nellie against society or Nellie against her dad, right? Mm-hmm. There it's one of the tougher relationships. It it reflects my real relationship with my dad. Some of those things that he says are word for word things that he said. I mean, he really did buy me baby shoes, baby moccasins for Christmas. No. He really <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, he really could uh, not get over uh, my breakup with my ex. He, I, um, I've done that, so I get it. <laughs> yeah, sadly, it can be hard. sadly. 
He did say he would pay for one eye of LASIK. I mean, he, a lot of this, he really did kind of push and push and push about the grandkids and the get back with your ex and the grandkids. And I, I want grandkids. I want grandkids. Um, and that's tough. That's a tough thing to hear when you're like all the reasons that, you know, that we've just discussed that you're like, I don't have anybody to have grandkids to have your, you know, any kids for you with, (laughs) I don't have, I'm still pursuing my dreams. I, I'm not sure if I'm meant to be a mom. The maternal instinct has not kicked in like all of these. And then to, on top of it, have your dad sort of, you know, badgering you. Um, but I, I hope that, and it was a really weird experience to watch the film for the first time with my dad. I flew oh. home to San Francisco where I'm from when the movie was in theaters and we all went, me and my family. And it was, I was nervous, you know, cause I was like, I hope my dad doesn't take this. I mean, he knew it was about him. He knew the, you know, the family dynamic is a reflection of our real life. And he knew it was about my story of freezing my eggs, but people are so funny. They're like, did he read the script? I'm like, my dad doesn't read scripts. Like, no, like they're like, he didn't go to South by. I was like, my dad doesn't know what South by is. Like, so this was pretty, you know, he'd seen the trailer. But, the, you know, this was pretty, he hadn't, he didn't have a deep understanding of what was to come. And he laughed the whole time, which was funny because I was like, okay, at least he's getting the humor. I don't know if he's getting the heart. He's laughing through my sex scenes. I'm like dying. I'm like. That's going to be uncomfortable God. for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to disappear. I'm like, at least he's like, has a sense of humor about it. And then the movie ends and the lights come up. And I stood up because the theater was full of friends and family. And Mm -hmm. I kind of like got, took a cheesy bow, you know, and then he leaned back in his chair and he just started to weep. It was such a weird experience. I've only seen my dad cry like two other times in my entire Mm -hmm. life. And he just was crying. And I, I didn't really, I got scared. I didn't really know. I didn't know if he was mad at me (laughs) or if he was hurt or really what was going on. And I think he was just really proud. And I think it was a lot to process. And I think, but he loved the movie. And I think, I hope ultimately that people see that in many ways, the man after this throwback tour of many men from the past, the the man that she ultimately is meant to be with always is her dad. That that is the true man in my life is my dad and my brother. Those are the men that will always be there still standing, still in my heart at the very end, I will always return to my daddy. That's very sweet. <laughs> and Clancy Brown, I mean, you can go, you can, you can do worse as a dad, you know? Oh, he's such a star. And he's just like, at that level of actor, that was one of the hardest roles to cast because at that level, none of these actors have anything to prove. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They don't need the money. They don't, you know, a lot of them have Oscars. I mean, they just are like (laughs) chilling. They've been doing it forever. And I wanted somebody that had a sense of humor. I wanted somebody who was a little scary. I wanted somebody who um, had, could, could really sell in the end that vulnerability so they can really have that journey and that in in a in a way of redemption Mm -hmm. arc um and clancy i was just when i found out he said yes i was just so relieved oh my gosh so so relieved because this movie with you know the dad as you know is just such a huge part of the film and he doesn't need notes anyway so (laughs) no are you kidding me he loves to rehearse he's just down he understands he, he improvises he's He's just one of those actors that's done it forever. I mean, he's been doing it longer than I have. So I'm like, it's amazing to just be in his presence, truly. He's a legend. He is. Truly. And yes. I, I like that you gave uh, Ego Wodum, I hope I said her name right. She, Wodum. Thank you. Um, like a, a real a real role, as opposed to, I, I feel like every time I see her and pop up in anything, it's always, you know, tying to Saturday Night Live and it's very comedic. She really has her own arc as your friend, best friend, I would say. Uh, throughout the film and I'm, I'm kind of curious is that also running uh coinciding with your own personal friendship yeah yeah, yeah. my real best friend ari was pregnant at her wedding mm. <laughs> and she while my life was still really getting figured out i mean i'm still figuring out my life but 
she had a house and a dog and two kids and a husband mm. in Chicago. So she was, she had this very traditional adult picture. And I was like, I feel like I'm living in Groundhog Day where I'm still pursuing the same dreams. I'm still in an apartment with a roommate. Like it just felt like I was so stunted compared to my best friend. Um, but there's so much love there. And I think mm -hmm. ultimately we grew up together in San Francisco and she's always cheering me on. So she loves the movie, of course, and like took all her friends in Chicago. She came to the premiere in LA and then she went to Chicago and had like a big screening. But but yeah, no, I think I I a lot of the the stuff from the film, the characters are all inspired by something in my life. And you wrote it, you directed it, you star in it. I mean, it's a lot of hats. And I think you delivered on all three. Like, sincerely, there I was watching, I was specifically watching directing because whenever you see someone that's a, a writer or an actor become a director, you really want to see, and I know you've done other stuff, but I, I really want to see like what you did with the camera and your choices. And I love the little title, or so, yeah, like the cool guy or whatever they were the, yeah the, i love all that peter pan nope all that stuff um <laughs> what was the biggest challenge for you because you're you're literally everywhere and i I know the last time i talked to you if i remember right you, producing is not something you really like to do <laughs> so that's a lot of hats that you're wearing uh, what was the biggest challenge i would say the biggest challenge is the imposter syndrome because I didn't go to film school, I mm. went to acting school. I have my degree in theater performance. So I felt very comfortable talking to my actors. I felt very comfortable rehearsing with my actors. Um, I, to be honest, I felt very comfortable acting myself, you know, mm. and, and being on camera and all of that I, I've done a lot of. But when you're the director and you're the writer and you're the star – I think everyone is like, how is she going to pull this off? Mm -hmm. You know, there is a, me included. And so you feel, and, and I'm sure a lot of that is just insecurity. It's not even, everyone is doing, busy doing their job. It's not like they're really focused on you. I think it's just your own insecurity, but you want to, you really want to hold on to everyone's belief in you. And sometimes I would be afraid to, go again for a second take or a third take because I was like, if I, if I have too many takes, they'll think that I don't know what I'm doing or that I, oh, I, see. I have faith in myself or that I'm not getting it or that I'm unsure of myself. And so I, I kept thinking that everyone was going to find me out that I don't really know what I'm doing. And the beauty of it, I will say is that there's not a whole lot of like brain space, <laughs> you end up so busy doing so go, many go, things. Go. Yes. And mm -hmm. so focused on trying to make a good movie and try each step of the way that those insecurities end up taking up less and less and less space in your brain because you have, it's being filled with, wait, what happened to this you know, production design thing that I wanted. What happened? You know, let's look at this costume is not totally working for me. Oh, my actor's not feeling well today. There's just like 8 million things happening. So it's kind of a great cure for imposter syndrome when you're wearing so many hats because the it's imposter syndrome comes from a space, I think, of being very focused on self mm -hmm. and very self-involved. And I think the nature of filmmaking, especially as a director, is the opposite. It's all about everything but you. It's all about the world, all about welcoming people, inspiring the vision, your vision, and kind of taking your vision out of your brain and putting it in everybody else's brain and showing them what your, you know, what the, the what your aim is. So I feel like that was the hardest thing to overcome. And once I got became so busy and so in love with my film, it just sort of started to fall away. And then it came back when it was time to release it at South by. <laughs> I feel like it left me and I felt really good for a while and I felt really proud of what we'd made. And then I had to release it to the world. And I was like, I don't know what we made. I don't know anymore. <laughs> well, we were nominated for the grand jury prize. So I think you should have felt pretty good walking out of there. Oh, thank yeah. you. I, I know I got to respect your time. I, I do want to ask because you, you write 
to put yourself you you started writing because you wanted to put yourself in things you want to see yourself in better projects etc cetera, etc cetera. now you're directing yeah. as you're directing yourself did you notice anything as an actor that because you're watching a lot more playbacks etc cetera, etc cetera, did you notice anything about your own acting that you you said you know what you noticed something or or you improved or modified some approach to something i guess is what I would say mm, from what I will say, I wasn't able to watch a lot of playback of myself as it was happening. And that was one of the things that was hard is I knew that my actors were getting it because I'm watching them. I'm in the mm-hmm. scenes with them. But if I watched each take to in order to review myself, we would just never make our days. So there was a lot of having to just trust that if I felt it, it was translating and it helped me a lot to watch my footage every night after I came home. It made me a little, I think, crazy because I would be working all day and then I would, until I fell asleep, be watching what I did that day. So you're just like in this constant space of the film and I'd be dreaming. I'm still shooting in my dreams. It was kind of intense. But um, what did I modify as I was watching myself? I just That's noticed good... about yourself. You know, I'm... you know what I noticed about myself, honestly? Okay, I hope I hope this is too like in the weeds, but so much of being an actor innately is about pleasing people and that's what's really hard and I I will fight about this all day because you can't tell me that an actor who spends their life auditioning for roles and then they tell you in acting school, they tell you like your job once you get to set is to show up deliver and get off set, Mm -hmm. like hit your mark, find your light, deliver the lines, be malleable, take direction. You don't need to be buddy, buddy with anybody. This isn't your time. This isn't a, you know, one woman show to be best friends with you're there to fulfill a purpose and then need to get off set. And that's kind of ingrained in you. And so your thinking is, I just want to do this correctly. I want to do well. I want to make you happy, Mr. Director, sir. (laughs) And you're in this constant state of of need and and need uh, the disease to please, right? And there's something really empowering and freeing and emboldening about being the Mr. Director, sir about be the only person I need to please here is myself. Mm -hmm. And the only person who knows how this needs to go is me. So there's something really, um, I just can't recommend it enough to an actor to remove that gatekeeper, that overlord that exists in your mind. I would even say, try to remove it with a, a director that isn't you when you go to set try it's so hard and this is why i'm 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 i haven't fully you know made my way through this idea in my head but i keep thinking about how how much more relaxed i was on my own set and how much braver i was on my own set and you could see it in the footage that it was very easy for me to cry it was very easy for me to laugh it was very easy for me to plug into these places because i think when you know that you cannot fail, when you know that you are safe, when you know that there's no one there to fire you mm-hmm. or to tell you you're doing something wrong or that you're you're way off the mark, you become free. So I would say that that's what I noticed in my footage, that I felt like a lot of tension was gone and I felt freer in my work because I think I knew that I was the boss. See, that's a beautiful answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. I just want actors to, and writers to direct. I want everyone to direct. I oh. think everyone should just not believe that they need to stay in their lane. I hate that. I, I wish that people, somebody had told me sooner. And I will say, I was told a lot in college Back when I was an actor, I was told a lot by my professors that I should direct. But back then, I thought that was them saying that they didn't believe in me as an actor. I thought they were saying that they didn't think I was talented enough to make it as an actor. So they were saying you should pivot. But now I really love them for saying that to me because they were saying, you have a vision. You Mm -hmm. have an idea of, of the entire world, not just your one place in it as a character. I love the soundtrack too, and I assume you had 
hands all over that. I did, oh yeah. I didn't see your name in it though. You didn't sing anything because I know you're a singer. That's so funny. People, some of my friends asked me why I chose not to. Like the the cover of changes that we made for the movie, which mm-hmm. is one of my favorite parts. Um, I got a singer that I love, Donna Missile, who I was a big fan of. And I just, there was something too meta <laughs> <laughs> about Nelly dancing to like Leah McKendrick while being directed by Leah McKendrick, <laughs> movie written by Leah McKendrick star. It just, it, at a certain point, it was like, I want to just um, celebrate women musicians that are not me, but thank you for pointing that out and asking. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I looked at the song list. I was like, she has to be on here somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. No. <laughs> I will say fun fact, the first song that you hear, it is very, very low in the background. It's the first scene of the film when she's a bridesmaid talking to the <laughs> groomsmen, they're figuring out how they're going to enter the venue. There's a song playing in the background that's like deep, deep, deep in the background. It's underneath. It's like as though it's playing at the wedding. It is my song. There you go. I'll dance for me. <laughs> and the reason we have that there is because it was free. <laughs> because I own it. If for no other reason than that, we needed something to play in the background. Oh, good. That's good. At least you got in there. Before I go, I know you're working on, I know what you did last summer. Uh, is it a reboot, sequel, Saboot? What is it? Um, it's a it's a sequel. Okay. Requel, if you will. Nice. Yeah. Not much you can say else. I'm t- I'm taking the hint. Okay. My favorite line for that movie is, well, that's balanced. I don't know if that's gonna be part of it, but I'm just letting you know. <laughs> that's one of my favorites. <laughs> I will say, here's what I will say about it. I try I'm I feel like I always say too much when I'm trying to like you know, I'm trying to share just the right amount where I don't get in trouble. But I will say that I grew up on it. It was one of my favorite films growing up. And I went to Southport and I soaked in the town, the history. I am very loyal to the original Mm -hmm. in many ways as a super fan. And I my hope is that the OG fans like myself are going to get all of the Easter eggs and all of the nods. But I promise you, it's not just we have pulled out a clean sheet of paper and we're starting over and it's a cash grab for for everyone. It is fully not that. I think that we justified, I hope and I believe that we, Jen and I, and the studio and the producers have justified a return to Southport. I have no doubt. Uh, I got to let you go. I know that. Uh, I want to make sure everybody checks out Scrambled. It's on demand right now. Wonderful job, sincerely. I'm not just saying that because you're here. I, I thought it was a great film. I didn't know what to expect. I love the switch in tone for you because the last the last feature that, that I saw at South By was MFA, and that was not this at all. So it's nice no. that, that you are showing you know how how flexible you are in terms of tone and scripts and genres. I think that's great. Hell yeah. Thank you so much, Aaron. And I want to thank you for following me in my career and and supporting me as I try on new hats. And it really means a lot to me when someone knows me from MFA and went to South by and like understands the journey of an indie filmmaker and 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 that we're still at it. It's pretty it's pretty special. We're growing together. This is pretty great. This is Lionsgate. So, you know, who knows what's next? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> well, good luck. I'll let you go. Just take care and best of luck to what's next. Send my love to your wife and I your will. kid. She's a new fan. She's a new fan. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. I love it. Thank her for, her, for my support as well. Thank right. you. You take care. Have a good one. Bye. Right, bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you appreciated it. Be sure to check out Scrambled. Come back for our next episode, which... You know, we've got South by Southwest coming up. There's a lot of things coming up. So make sure you're subscribed. Also check out our our true crime podcast, Inspired by a True Story, where we look at the true stories behind movies based on a true crime. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out Scrambled. And remember, when you do head to the theater or sit comfortably on your couch watching this great film, buy popcorn.